And so this is going to get us to what I thought was the most interesting thing of today, which is that we got these tapes. What are the tapes? I've been waiting them for, for them for this whole trial, which is we knew that in November of 2022, as everything was starting to blow up, right after it was believed that Binance was going to buy FTX, Caroline had an all-hands meeting with the employees of Alameda to tell them about what happened, where she got pretty honest about the whole situation and quite infamously, famously infamously, was asked who made the decision to use customer funds and Caroline said, Sam, I guess. <laughs> All right, y'all, we are back day seven of the Sam Bankman Freed trial, and we had a whole lot of everything today. We got the cross-examination of Caroline Ellison. We got the redirect of Caroline Ellison, which means when the prosecution gets back up after the defense has done their thing. We got another witness today. In fact, we got two more witnesses today. We got Christian Drapey, who was a software developer at Alameda when all of this went down. So we got his testimony, we got his cross-examination, and we even started to introduce another witness, Zach Prince, who was the co-founder and CEO of BlockFi. We got into the very beginning of his testimony today before we had to break for the day. So a lot happened. We are going to get into it starting right now. And I'm going to start with the cross-examination of Caroline Ellison. <laughs> <clears throat> if you have been following this trial, certainly if you've been following my coverage of it, you know that the defense has left something to be desired when it comes to their cross-examinations. And I think to some degree, all of us who have been following this closely, we're waiting to see what they did with Caroline. It felt like, okay, you know, maybe they're not doing a great job or we're just not clear what they're trying to do with these other witnesses, but Caroline is their key. Caroline is the one they want to blame this all on. This is who they're pawning it off on. So may maybe they've been marshalling all their resources to really bring it for the Caroline cross. If that was the case, I don't get it. I don't get it. And I've said before, I don't want to be like the backseat driver or like the sports fan who's sitting on the couch with my beer being like, that coach totally shouldn't have made that call. Like, okay, bro, well, you're not the one being paid $10 million to make the call. So maybe you don't know better. And I want to be careful not to be that person in this case. I'm not a lawyer, but I've now spoken with lawyers who are there in the courtroom watching this case play out as spectators or representing third parties who have an interest in this whole thing, whatever. And they also seem confused by what the defense is trying to do. Now, something I want to do in this video, and I, I won't spend too long on it, is I want to help explain maybe why the defense is so bad, because it does seem wild. It feels weird to be saying that. And then I also want to talk about some of the punches that I think they landed today. So let's get into it. On the punches I think they landed, I've talked about this before, something that they are clearly trying to do with every witness, whether it's Adam Yadidia, Gary Wang, or now Caroline Ellison, is they are trying to suggest that there is a conflict of interest because all of these witnesses have cooperation agreements with the prosecution. Now, historically, I don't think the this has been very interesting or necessarily very compelling. I do think that the way Mark Cohen ex crossed Caroline today, I, I thought the point was a little bit more compelling. Like, I, I, I was like, all right, I, I see your point. You know, he emphasized that Caroline had met with pr the prosecution over 20 times when he asked her how, how long he would usually meet with them. She said a few hours, three or four hours. So she spent 60 to 80 hours talking to these prosecutors, answering their questions. You can also tell she's, and this is true for all the witnesses so far, they're very buttoned up when the prosecution asks them questions. They're succinct, they're compact, they're clear. They, generally speaking, know the answer to every question the prosecution asks them. Whereas when they get crossed, the defense gets up there and suddenly these people can't remember shit. They're like, mm, I don't remember that. I don't recall that. I, I wouldn't characterize it that way. Now, the defense's questions are less clear. Like, this is part of the reason the defense feels kind of incompetent. If they're kind of bumbling, they get objected to all the time. And it's objections that all of us who are lay people understand. We're like, yeah, no, that was weird. They're putting the wrong exhibits up when they're trying to show exhibits to the jury. Like, they just feel like they're bumbling around a bit. So that's part of why I think the answers to their questions are less clear is because their, their questions are just less good. But it's also a product of well, the prosecution has been talking to them for 80 hours over the last seven months. So they're just, they're, their memories are fresher on the kinds of things the prosecution is going to ask them. But the result of all this is that you do see the, this contrast and you, you are like, oh, okay, well, 
it does feel like the prosecution has a bit of an advantage here because it's very clear that these witnesses are in the bag for the prosecution and they're the prosecution's witnesses. So by definition, they essentially are. The other thing that's interesting and that emphasizes or that further creates this impression is on a couple of different occasions with Caroline and on at least one occasion with Gary, the defense is clearly trying to ask them a question that had been asked to them by, by prosecutors in their in one of their early meetings with prosecutors. It's clear that the defense has like a transcript of one of the early meetings that each of these witnesses had with the prosecution and they're trying to pull out answers that they gave. And so the defense is asking Caroline, for example, today, the defense was asking her how her communication with Sam was after the two of them broke up. And she was saying, you know, I tried to avoid him. I didn't like to have one-on-one -on -one in person meetings with him and I avoided social situations with him, but I, still talk, communicated with him about professional matters over signal, and I would still be in group meetings with him. And then the, process, and then the defense asked, is it true that you only communicated him with, with him when absolutely necessary? And you can see what the defense is trying to do. They're tr clearly trying to paint this picture that, well, as everything was collapsing, and even and prior to that, you know, Al Caroline wasn't really talking to Sam because they had broken up, so Sam didn't really know what was going on. He wasn't really privy to everything that was happening. He didn't know that customer funds were being used or whatever, whatever their case is. That's what they're trying to paint. But Caroline was like, no, I wouldn't say it's true that I didn't speak with him unless it was absolutely necessary. And so then the defense is like, mm, well, let me see if I can refresh your memory about something you said to prosecutors. I'm, I'm speed running through this. But basically the bottom line is then they show the witness, and they did this to Gary in an instant with, instance with Gary as well, a piece of paper that we can't see, but that is presumably some sort of transcript about this early meeting they had with prosecutors where they clearly said something to the effect of, I only hung out with, or I only talked to Sam when absolutely necessary after we broke up. And, and then the defense asks the witness, they, in this case, Caroline, like, does this refresh your memory about the way you spoke about this to prosecutors back in the day. Again, that's not how the question was framed, but it's giving you the general gist. And Caroline was like, no, this doesn't refresh my memory. And I've talked about this with a couple people because we're all like, what, really? Like, I understand not remembering something that you said 11 months ago. But if, you, if I saw a transcript of something that I said 11 months ago, I'd probably remember it. Now, again, I don't know that it's a transcript is necessarily what they're reading, but... It's something that almost works to the defense's benefit in optically because it does give you the feeling of like, oh, this person really feels like they're being way more helpful to the prosecution than they're being to the defense. So then when you additionally hear them make the point, like Mark Cohen, the defense attorney, make the point that, oh, they've got a cooperation agreement and she's met with these lawyers, she's met with the prosecution for over 20 times and her lawyers has, have also talked privately with the prosecution over 20 times, like you do start to feel like, okay, like this is, I don't think that it makes her, her it doesn't hurt her credibility to me really because I do think she's telling the truth and we're going to get to proof that she's telling the truth a little bit later in this episode. But it does make you feel like, wow, the defense is working at a disadvantage. And so I want to talk about that disadvantage and a, a couple of the disadvantages I think the defense is working with in just a moment. But I want to say one final thing in terms of the punches that the defense managed to land today. Funny enough, the second and last punch <laughs> that I would highlight and that I would that I would mention, it actually also has to do with this, does this refresh your memory dynamic that was at play. And specifically, there was a moment where they asked about when Sam found out that some of the money that customers were wiring in order to trade on FTX was still going to an Alameda bank account. So just, actually, I'm gonna, so to give some context here, for folks who haven't been following this closely. In the early days, FTX had a really hard time getting their own bank accounts, which was common for crypto companies. Alameda already had bank accounts. So in the early days of FTX, they set up wire instructions for anybody who wanted to wire money in order to trade on FTX. They would wire that money into the North Dimension bank account, which was an Alameda bank account. Even once FTX got their own bank accounts, there were still some leg legacy customers who I guess had it pre-programmed in their system or whatever, so continued to wire money to this Alameda bank account. And when Caroline learned of this or discovered this or whatever, she was like, oh shit, we should probably fix this. Like it shouldn't still be coming into this account. She said something to Sam about it, he agreed. And so the, the, defense, was and so the defense was asking her about this. And it was a little bit confusing, but essentially asking like, you know, did Sam, ever really, did Sam really know about this? And she was saying, yes, Sam knew that the money was still going into the Alameda bank account. But then they showed her one of these transcripty things and says like, does this refresh your memory? And she was like, oh, about what you told prosecutors 
about that. Again, I'm kind of butchering these questions, but I'm just trying to give you the, the picture here. And she was like, oh yeah, like that refreshes my memory. I suppose I might've told them that, I might've told them that he, that Sam, he might not have known that funds were being sent to the legacy Alameda account. I'm grasping at straws here a little bit, but in terms of, oh, what a big powerful punch the, pro the, the defense landed. But it did do two things. One, it made Caroline look a little wobbly, like she had said one thing right then in court, but she had apparently previously said something else to the prosecutors. And second, if you believed the first version of what she said, the, the, as in the version she told prosecutors way back in the day, it speaks to, okay, maybe Sam really didn't know what was going on. He wasn't involved in the nitty gritty. He wasn't really aware they were taking customer deposits. Like it could, it could speak to that certainly that he just wasn't as involved in the nitty gritty. So that's why I put it in a camp. It was a two parter of a little bit of a punch that they landed. Beyond that, I kid you not when I say there really wasn't that much to this cross examination. It's so funny. Usually when I make these videos, I don't even have to look back at my notes that much to prepare the videos because it just all stands out to me so much. Man, I was like trawling through all my different notebooks today because I take a lot of notes and just to be like, what, what, what did we even talk about? Because it all just felt so, frankly, useless. Like it just did not feel interesting. So let me introduce you to, to a brand new company here that I could not have more talked to. About. Like I said, other Web3 lawyers sense. who are in the courtroom watching this, who understand this stuff from a legal perspective, to give you, you know, the having deepest, talked to other most meaningful intelligence into any What's NFT the best community. you can say about the defense? What's the defense of the defense out there? And here's what I would say. I think there's a few things. First of all, the judge did has said up sophisticated data sets science to what the defense is doing. First of all, I've seen in the NFT ecosystem. The judge has set up sophisticated data science to wall it out. Right? There's tons of behavioral patterns and help shaping to admit that. In other words, they can tell you which Twitter accounts are actually the influencers. Sorts of things. We know there are things that the you what wanted to be able to bring up in a during community. this trial. They By looking at what other communities token holders are involved in. Scope, the number of use cases here is virtually we see unlimited. So whether you're a trader, the creator, creator between the institution, and brand, agency, when the jury's not there, I promise like Web3 debating about things being admissible or not. With and so you watch all this legal insights fly back and forth. There's things that the defense clearly wants to be able to bring up that they can't. And they can't even get close to touching those things. Or they can't have their line of questioning. They're still in the very early days. So that's limiting. Second of all, and this goes to... So if you're interested in learning more about what Web3 sense conflict of interest for you and your business and you, you should tell, be my go goodness, and fill out these very short form well trained link to in the show notes and some whether of the prosecution trained them or their own lawyers trained them for a product I mean, they are tight they don't they don't say too much that to open the door to, to to other things that maybe would look bad for the for the prosecution and and Caroline in particular I mean she was great because she didn't seem rehearsed you only noticed it because she had the answers for most of the prosecution's questions and she didn't necessarily have the answers to the, the defense's questions so she doesn't come across overly rehearsed but that's part of I feel like the good training but it's definitely tough to be the defense attorney in a case where the witness has talked to the prosecutors for 60 hours and and you haven't been able to ask questions before which leads me to the next disadvantage I think they have which is <laughs> There are clearly moments where the defense attorney expect one answer from the witness and then get a different one, a different one that does not open the door that they want opened. And my my personal pet theory that I've run past other people now and they, they seem to agree is I think at least in some of these instances, they have essentially just gotten bad intel from Sam, where I think Sam believes a lot of his own bullshit. And I, I, I th I've thought this for a bunch of these witnesses where he's said something to his lawyers about something that happened or, oh, Caroline and Gary spoke privately about that. That would be an example from today where the defense attorney asked Caroline if she ever talked about hedging with Gary privately between January 2022 and August of 2022. I don't even know that it matters the why of that. I think they were trying to paint a picture of like, well, Gary may have also been a part of the try to put a little bit of blame on Gary again, show that things were going on behind Sam's back. That was uh, sort of, I think, what they were trying to get at there. But instead of saying, yes, I talked about hedging with Gary privately between January 2022 and August of 2022, Caroline goes, uh, yeah, I don't recall ever speaking privately with Gary or so even, I think, talking to Gary in general about, about hedging. And it's like, where did you get the information that you thought she had? I mean, it could be any number of places, but there was just time and time again throughout this trial, there's been moments where the defense attorney has asked a question where I think they were expecting one answer because of things Sam has told them, and then they got a totally different answer. So that's, I think that's been hard. I think that's a challenge that they're trying to work through. And then finally, something I think that's important to consider is there may be 
short term, there may be more effective ways to maybe discredit the witness or to impugn their motives or to do any number of things that would in the short term look like they help the defense, but maybe they open the door then for the prosecution in redirect to go to, to bring up something. It like opens the scope, right? So that the prosecution can now come in and redirect and ask a bunch of things that are going to look really bad for Sam. So I think that's the other limiting factor when we're sitting there going, why aren't they asking about this? Why aren't they asking about that? Why don't they go down this road? It's like, well, I'm not thinking through ooh, what, what else could this lead to in terms of what the prosecution could then get up and talk about. So that would be, that's what I would say my, again, defense of the defense. I think they obviously have the harder task here. I also think they have a guilty client, which makes it hard as well. And I, I think justifies at least some of the unbelievably boring, bad cross-examination we seem to be getting. Finally, I want to talk about a couple of quick things that were interesting for any number of reasons that, are, that just jumped out at me when we got in in the cross-examination and then the redirect of Caroline Ellison. Here was one that I thought was really interesting that worked in the prosecution's favor that came up during the redirect, which is they asked Caroline if she had known that the line of credit that Alameda had with FTX was $65 billion, like specifically that number. And they asked that because the, the defense, speaking of opening the door, the defense had kind of asked her about it. And anyway, so... I won't even get into all that. But so the prosecution asked her if she knew that the line of credit Alameda had was $65 billion. And this shocked me. She said no. She had at no point apparently known specifically what Alameda's line of credit was on FTX. Why does this matter? This matters because at the end of the day, the crime that was committed here was Alameda taking customer funds to use in other ways. And there were two ways they took customer funds. One was through the bank account, the North Dimension bank account. They just took fiat. And then the other way they took customer funds was directly they, they withdrew money off of FTX, the exchange. And so in some ways, the smoking gun, the crime was allowing them to withdraw unlimited funds off of the FTX exchange. Gary is the one who coded that. He testified to that. We saw that in the code base. And Gary testified that Sam is the one who told him to do it. And so this just distances Caroline even further, it feels like, from this actual crime to find out she didn't even know. Like she was not in the nitty gritty enough of the tactically pulling off this crime to have even known that $65 billion was the line of credit. It doesn't exonerate her, but I, I found that really striking. I was so surprised to hear that she didn't even know $65 billion was the number of the line of credit. Other things that I thought were interesting, I mean, they clearly were trying to do something. They were trying to show that she was like ambitious or, or trying to make a point about, oh, this ambitious competitive woman thing that they were going for. They asked her early on if she would describe herself as ambitious. I don't think this line of questioning went the way they were sort of hoping because they asked if she thought of herself as ambitious or if she was ambitious. And she's, I wouldn't have really thought of myself as ambitious until Sam encouraged that in me, which I also thought worked against her a little bit because historically throughout this testimony, she's almost laid it on a little too thick as to how much she was just an agent of Sam. There's a degree to which you're like, all right, come on, you're a very smart woman. You had some degree of control over things. You know, you're telling me you weren't even ambitious until you met this dude like that feels. But but anyway, I, I'm, I'm sure she means it when she says like she didn't really think of herself as that ambitious. She was like a math nerd. And then Sam put her in this position to be the CEO of this company. And, and suddenly, I guess she was ambitious. The other interesting thing that stuck out at me in this same vein of trying to paint her as as sort of ambitious and competitive was they brought up Modulo, which was another crypto trading firm that Sam had invested a lot of money into. He was had a 65% ownership stake, and it was run by another ex -Jane, two ex Jane Street traders, one of whom Sam had dated. So I've covered this before, which is he had invested in two crypto trading funds, firms, and one hedge fund-ish thing, whatever, that were run by ex-girlfriends of his. And at, at some point in 2022, they were having a hard time, not the girls per se, the girlfriends, but the, the companies were having a hard time getting along with one another. And so Caroline was asked about that a little bit by the defense. Did you see these? Did you feel competitive with them? She said yes. And then the defense asked if she had any, did you want to crush them? And use that word. And Caroline said, yeah, there were times where I had feelings like that. Like I wanted to crush them. Uh, so that was interesting. You know, that I, I, that just jumped out at me and I guess served the defense's purpose of showing that she was competitive. I mean, I'll say it for the, I don't know, third time, but it feels like grasping at straws. Like, I don't think it fundamentally discredited her in any way. She has been a, it feels like a very airtight witness. 
And so this is going to get us to what I thought was the most interesting thing of today, which is that we got these tapes. And I say this is relevant because the tapes show a certain amount of consistency in Caroline's story. What are the tapes? I talked about them yesterday. I've been waiting them for, for them for this whole trial, which is we knew that in November of 2022, as everything was starting to blow up, right after it was believed that Binance was going to buy FTX, Caroline had an all-hands meeting with the employees of Alameda to tell them about what happened, where she got pretty honest about the whole situation and quite infamously, famously infamously, was asked who made the decision to use customer funds and Caroline said, Sam, I guess. And I was very interested to see how this was going to be handled in court, assuming these, these tapes were played, because I didn't know if that, I guess, was going to leave some room open for the defense to make a case. So I want to talk about the tapes we heard, how it was handled, but first, we need to hear a word from our amazing sponsors who make this show possible. OpenSea, Ledger, Web3Sense. I'm so grateful for y'all. It's a tough time in crypto media and really grateful for you supporting content creators like myself. Let's hear it for them. Boom. Okay. Um, Let me introduce you to a brand new company that I could not be more excited about. Web3Sense, a Web3 analytics platform that combines on-chain data with social media insights to give you the deepest, most meaningful intelligence into any NFT community. I have tested other analytics platforms out there, but Web3Sense has the most comprehensive capabilities I've seen in the NFT ecosystem. They apply sophisticated data science to wallet histories to determine behavioral patterns and help shape predictive analytics. In other words, they can tell you which Twitter accounts are actually the influencers in your space. And they can tell you what resonates most within a community by looking at what other communities' token holders are involved in. The number of use cases here is virtually unlimited. So whether you're a trader, creator, institution, brand, agency, I promise Web3Sense has data that you want to see with the deep and actionable insights that you need to build, analyze, grow, start, whatever you want to do within the NFT space and in terms of building a business and a community. Now, they are still in very early days, so they're eager to connect with the community. So if you're interested in learning more about what Web3 cents can do for you and your business and you should be go and fill out the very short form linked to in the show notes and someone from their team will reach out with more information and an opportunity for a product demo trust me you won't regret it let me tell you about OpenSea studio yes you know OpenSea. perhaps you use OpenSea, but did you know they launched OpenSea studio it's a one-stop shop for all creators to launch and manage their projects Using OpenSea Studio, you can create and manage a drop end-to-end, -end, including setting up allow list phases, uploading media and metadata, which has helpful preview functionality, and building the drop page itself. You can also mint an NFT or collection where the creator owns the contract. OpenSea Studio lets you build on all blockchains compatible with OpenSea, and there are eight of them. Let's buyers mint an NFT from your collection using a credit or debit card, and there are no coding or technical skills required to do any of the above. OpenSea will be adding more features and functionality to OpenSea Studio over the coming months, including revamped collection pages with new storytelling modules, and more ways to leverage NFT technology, including redeemables, which y'all know I'm a huge fan of, and analytics. I'm an OpenSea user because they have the best selection of NFTs and a truly inclusive view of the NFT ecosystem, supporting, as I said, eight chains in eight global languages. And because I trust the systems they've built to help keep the space safe, like copyment protection, malicious URL detection or removal, robust verification, and more. It is why they are the place to buy, sell, and now create NFTs. Check them out at the link below and you'll be supporting the show in the process. Y'all know the phrase, not your keys, not your crypto. Well, in a world where too many people have had to learn that the hard way, Overpriced JPEGs is proud to partner with Ledger, the world leader in critical digital asset security. Ledger's Nano S Plus and Nano X hardware wallets, paired with the Ledger Live app, Ledger's own software for setting up your Nano device and managing your crypto assets, is the easiest way to start your crypto journey while maintaining full control of your digital assets. You can use all your favorite dApps with Ledger Live, accessing 15 plus Web3 apps, including OneInch, Paraswap, Lido, and Zerion. So you can not only manage, but also grow your portfolio. And Ledger Live is available on mobile and desktop. Securing digital assets shouldn't be complicated. Ledger is as easy as it gets. Uncompromising security, effortless connectivity, full transparency, Ledger is your one-stop shop to trade and track crypto, grow your assets, and manage NFTs. Secure your future with Ledger. Visit shop.ledger.com today or check out the link in the show notes. All right, we're back. We are going to talk about these tapes. So importantly, these tapes came up not during the examination or cross-examination or questioning of Caroline Ellison. We ended that part of the day where 
definitely felt like the prosecution, ding, 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 also won that battle. And we moved on to our next witness. Our next witness, as I mentioned at the top, I believe, was Christian Drapey. He was a software engineer at Alameda between from May 2021 until November 2022. And the most interesting part of his testimony, which was pretty short, was that he was very clear that Sam was the one who was calling the shots. He was asked who did Caroline Ellison and Sam Tribuco, the two co-CEOs of Alameda for a while, who did they report to? Christian said they reported to Sam. Sam remained very involved with trading decisions. He, he remained very involved to the point that he still had direct contact with a bunch of Alameda employees. It sounded like he was directly telling certain Alameda traders what trades to place. So it wasn't even like he stepped back from Alameda and just delegated everything through Caroline. He specifically... He would bypass Caroline sometimes and just talk to the traders and tell them what to do. So I thought that was compelling to hear that from somebody outside of just the executive team who clearly has reason to want Sam, to want to be able to say that, oh, Sam was the one in charge. To hear from Christian, I, I thought was pretty compelling. And then we got the tapes. And I think we got the tapes during Christian's testimony because Christian was at the meeting and he was one of the people you heard asking questions in this meeting. So one fun fact about where these tapes came from. They came from another Alameda trader who had apparently started three days prior to this meeting. So that elicited some laughter from the press corps when, when Christian said that because I guess we all just were, were thinking like, oh my God, this poor trader joins three days ago, three days later, everything's imploding. And you, you can tell, okay, clearly this guy then is thinking, I have no loyalty to this company and I am not, I'm not getting myself into this mess. I'm going to record this because the police are going to need to hear about this. This is crazy. Whatever. I mean, I have no idea what he was actually thinking, but that was who recorded the meeting secretly and nobody knew the, the meeting was being recorded. Christian testified to that. He said, you know, Caroline wouldn't have known this meeting was being recorded. None of us knew. Okay. So what did we find out? Six tapes were played during the prosecution's time. First tape was of Caroline just opening up the meeting and explaining what was going on. Specifically, what she said was that FTX had a shortfall of user funds because Alameda took loans from customers to make investments. She mentioned specific investments like Anthropic, GDC, GD, GDB, GD, a mining company. She also specifically mentioned um, the buyback of FTX equity shares, or by FTX equity, she, FTX bought that back from Binance. And like $2 billion worth. And she said that was like one of the big investments that they made that caused them to be insolvent. And she also later mentioned, of course, that basically what they'd done is borrowed from customers to, to pay back their lenders. And it was, you know, in some ways the lenders' money they'd used to make all these investments. Okay, so that was the first tape. Then we had five more tapes from there that were all short clips where somebody asked a question and we heard Caroline's answer. So Christian Drapey on the tape asked, had there been attempts made to return the money to customers? Was there a plan to return money to customers? Caroline said in, in the tape, she said, you know, we were, we've been trying to raise money, but it's difficult given the current landscape to, to try and raise. So that's what she said there. The second question, I think also by Christian, was about who knew about this. And initially Caroline hedges and doesn't really answer the question, which I think was her not wanting to incriminate anybody in that moment. But then as she's pushed a little bit more, she ultimately says, okay, well, the only people that I know knew, the only people I ever spoke about it with were uh, Sam, Gary, and Nishad. Now, what's interesting is Christian had said in one of his questions asking about who knew, like something along the lines of, well, obviously Sam knew, but like who else knew about this? And I think that's striking because again, it corroborates this sense that everybody who was there th th thought Sam was in charge. And this was not, this is not just the impression that Gary and Caroline are trying to give us all. The next question, which was also Christian, he was he was tough, he was chatty in this meeting, was he was essentially trying to get at like how premeditated was this? And he he said the phrase, he's like, like I'm assuming this wasn't like a YOLO thing. <laughs> at which point he was asked to explain what YOLO means, and then he turned to the the boomer jurors and was like, So in this context, like a YOLO thing, what I meant by that was like a spur of the moment decision. Uh, but it was kind of funny to hear somebody explain the term YOLO thing in uh, in open court. And I don't remember Caroline's exact answer there. I was running, I literally ran out of all my notebook space. So I was taking tiny little notes, but she said something to the effect of like, no, it was premeditated. Yes, it wasn't like just like completely spur of the moment or whatever. Um, and then 
And then the smoking gun tape, if you will, the infamous moment where a woman, a, a trader at the firm called, named Diana, I guess, asked who made the decision to use customer money. And Caroline giggles, which is a little, little weird, but we'll talk about that in a second. And then she says, Sam, I guess. And here's how that I guess was handled. When Caroline was testifying, though we did not hear the tapes during Caroline's testimony, the prosecution asked her about this all-hands meeting and asked her if she remembered saying that Sam was the one who made the decision to use customer funds and that she had specifically said, Sam, I guess. Caroline testified that she did remember saying that. And when asked about why did you say I guess, she said it was a verbal tick. She said I was nervous. She's like, that wasn't an indication that I, I wasn't sure. It was just that I was nervous and it was a verbal tick. What was so interesting was that as we heard these tapes, you could hear in Caroline speaking, she said, I guess, a lot. And I clocked that. I was like, oh, she keeps saying the word I guess, which does verify her version of things. And then when it came to that little laugh, when she laughed and said, Sam, I guess, the prosecution asked Christian what his interpretation of that laugh was. And he said it was nervous laughter. Like she was not happy in this moment. It was just clearly she was nervous and so she was laughing. So that... That was probably my favorite part of today was hearing those tapes. It was really interesting. And I thought Christian was a, a good witness. He was definitely like the broiest witness we, we've gotten so far. But I think it was effective to hear somebody outside of the executive team talk about their version of, of, of what went down and how they learned about it. The defense then got up to cross-examine Christian Drapey. The defense did then play their own clip of Caroline from this same day. It was about an hour, I think, after the first round of clips that we had heard. It, this, this clip that they played happened like an hour later. And it was basically <clears throat> somebody saying to Caroline, you know, thanks for your honesty. I'm, I'm sure this isn't easy. And then Caroline said, giggles again. She does a little laugh thing. And she says, it was kind of fun. I don't know. Or something like that. She said it, it was kind of fun. And she's laughing which obviously seems pretty incongruous with the moment and what's going on. And so that's what the defense was. That was the point that, of course, they were trying to make. They were trying to leave the jurors with this sense that, like, whatever they were going to take from that, that this woman was maybe bad in some way. It certainly didn't land for me. I don't, I don't know how the jurors interpreted it. But because we'd already heard the testimony from Caroline regarding the text she had sent to Sam, where she said, we saw a previous text where she said, if this gets much worse, I don't think I'm going to be able to take it. And then... She actually responds to that text later and says, wow, that was such a bad prediction. I felt I feel better than I've felt in months. And and she explained, I thought, well, and she cried, but just saying that she was just so relieved at that point. Like she had such a roller coaster of emotions. She said this was the worst week of my life, like probably the worst day of my life, but that she had been dreading that day for so long that there was a relief from just unburdening herself with from the 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 lies and the guilt and all of it, that that was leading her to be relieved and happy in a way. So I saw this comment about it was kind of fun as being very much in the vein of that text of like just relief. I'm assuming most of the jurors are going to take it that way as well, but who knows? Who knows how they heard it? Okay, last thing of the day, we had one final witness take the stand, a man named Zach Prince. He was the co-founder and CEO of BlockFi. And we only got the very beginning of his testimony because we ended up wrapping for the day. But what he, we got like his biographical information, what BlockFi is, and we just started to get at the fact that BlockFi, he testified that BlockFi went bankrupt in part because of money they lost because of FTX and Alameda. Specifically, he said that Alameda owed BlockFi $650 million by the time that Alameda declared bankruptcy and that BlockFi also had a, a number of assets. We didn't get a specific number on the FTX exchange, the combination of which meant that they ultimately had to declare bankruptcy. So we were just starting to get into it, just the tip before we broke, and we're gonna hear a lot more about all of that, I imagine, tomorrow. But that was it, that was the day. Uh, so much happened, and yet, certainly when it came to the cross-examination, it was like, it was like more forgettable, despite that there was a lot, there was a lot going on, but we did pack it in with three different witnesses that we heard from. And I will be back tomorrow in the courtroom to hear the end of Zach Prince's testimony. And if we get another witness tomorrow, which I imagine we will, I will, of course, tell you all about that. Thank you so much to all of you who have been watching these videos. Please do like, subscribe, comment, all the things. I really appreciate it. I love reading all your comments. And I will see you next time.